So I've known and respected Darren for a number of years now, and I welcome the opportunity to introduce him from afar. Um, Darren grew up in Texas and was in Head Start's first class. And the Ford Foundation was one of the key early funders of Head Start. And now he finds himself leading the Ford Foundation. I have many friends uh, for whom Head Start gave them an early opportunity too. And they also went on to great things. And Ford concedes and supports amazing change and continues to do so. Darren grew up in a segregated county in Texas, possibly foreshadowing an element of his future work. The name of the county was Liberty. He was raised by a single mother. And as you'll soon see when we send you uh, this month's 60 Minutes piece on Darren, when he was a child, his mom had to pay him to stop talking so much. Oh, I can't believe you. Yes, yeah, she said it. I didn't. Um, I know. And thankfully, he so keeps talking now, not just this moment. Um, and so many are grateful that he does. He's one of the leading voices for combating inequality and one of the leading advocates for justice. He's been on many new, um, you know, leadership lists, including Times 100 Most Influential People. And recently, uh, he was named Wall Street, Wall Street Journal's 2020 Philanthropy Innovator. I've had the pleasure and privilege to know Darren, to be with him in places, including sitting together at the historic gathering at the Vatican. And he's a force and a special and wonderfully unique person and thoughtful change agent, and he's fun. So for the rest of my remarks, I'll steal a page from This Is, for your, Li this is your Life, for those who recall that show, but with anonymous sources. Um, I learned that yes, at work, he's in charge of one of the biggest foundations in the world, but his dog, Mary Lou, she runs his life. Um, he's a very, very proud alum of the University of Texas. He apparently has mild, yeah, the Hilcom Horns. Um, he apparently has mild separation anxiety when he's not near a Diet Coke, although I understand you're doing much better. Um, he had opinions on every last detail of the, of the renovation of Ford's headquarters, right down to the upholstery and fixtures. It was an inside joke the staff enjoyed about his design sense and his attention to detail. Um, Darren's truly passionate about the importance of the arts. One of, my, one of the quintessential Darren moments for me was when I saw a video of him presenting at a virtual ballet Hispanical event. He started out at his desk at the Ford Foundation, very serious tone, and then suddenly Pharrell's Happy started playing. And um, Darren started dancing incredibly through the halls of Ford. Uh, well, I, I soon learned that it was actually his dance double. And even though it wasn't actually Darren dancing, it's clear that he does dance to a different drummer and it's great. So lastly, uh, Darren, whenever I talk with members of your team or broader peers, um, they have such great love and respect for you as a human being and as a leader. Everyone talks with such gratitude about the privilege to work with and for you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Heather and I know we look forward to your conversation and the opportunity to ask you questions. Great, thanks, Jim. Darren, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you. And I wanted to start just by asking, why did you come and take this role at the Ford Foundation? Jim shared a little bit about your background. Feel free to add some more about your background, but what was important to you in choosing to take this leadership role in philanthropy at the Ford Foundation? Thank you, Heather. It's just um, a huge honor. And of course, my friend, Jim, um, as he always is, is far too effusive um, about uh, my achievements. Um, I, I uh, am so honored to know him and so grateful that he introduced me to you, Heather. And uh, I get to see through the two of you, the work of the Templeton Foundation and it's inspiring. I think I came to Ford uh, and I think I came to philanthropy because I believe philanthropy in a democracy has a critical role to play. Uh, I start with the belief that uh, as Jim mentioned, my background has made me a person who is enormously grateful to my country. I know that my story could only be uh, a narrative told in the United States of America. And therefore I believe deeply in the ideals of this country even the flawed ways in which it was founded and the inadequacies of our founding documents to ensure uh, at the time of our founding full participation. 
the genius of our founders, in spite of their flaws, was that they left us the tools to repair and to heal. And so I see philanthropy as playing a role in helping this nation to heal, helping this nation to repair. I believe that Henry Ford's remit that the Ford Foundation support and strengthen democracy and democratic institutions is for me a motivating force in my own life because I believe in democracy. I believe that there is no better way to organize a system of governance. I believe in capitalism, that there is no better way to organize an economic system. But I also believe that both our democracy and capitalism must be attended to, particularly through the lens and from the perspective of those people who have been historically left out of participating in the full richness of democracy and in the full opportunity of real shared prosperity that capitalism can, has the potential and has in American history during periods of American history delivered that idea of shared prosperity. So for me, philanthropy is a calling. Uh, it is something not to do because it's about giving away money. Actually the giving away money part of it, while important and necessary and essential, is not what I really uh, get most excited about. Um, and so I feel, you know, Heather, that we are so privileged to be in the places we are, whether it's Templeton or Ford or Rockefeller where I was before. And so the question for me is what are we doing with that privilege? How are we leveraging it? For whom? Um, and so that's why I'm in philanthropy. So when you, um, when I first became president of the Templeton Foundation, I read this great article about you in the New Yorker, which really was the first time where I think it was communicated that Ford had decided to focus on inequality. And my question for you is why focus? What was the, the value of focusing all that Ford was doing around this theme and why inequality? Well, the focus part of their quite candidly was the assessment of our trustees and an assessment, a diagnosis I shared that the foundation's work was too decentralized, too atomized, uh, no longer really impactful in many uh, areas we worked in. Um, we had lost, uh, I think, our, uh, our influence in particular spheres of, of geopolitical, um, economic, and, and social policy work that we were doing in various parts of the world. And it just felt that we were a lot of little fiefdoms with, and if you went to our India office and said, what does the Ford Foundation do in the world? You got a different answer than in our South Africa office or in New York. And so what we did was to really first agree that if we wanted to have impact, we needed to have greater focus. And so the focus question was uh, easier. The harder question was focus on what? Um, and for me, what was important was to find an organizing principle, an organizing problem that we as a philanthropy could, in our modest grain of sand, you know, on the beach um, way, have some contribution to addressing, highlighting, framing. And inequality emerged through work uh, surveys really of our grantees, of, of um, experts. When we ask the question, as I'm sure you all do with your strategy, certainly when we sort of did the meta big picture strategy questions and analysis, we were concerned about what are the threats? Right? So, so Henry Ford said he wanted the Ford Foundation to support and strengthen democracy in America and around the world. That was one of the four pillars. What are the threats to strengthening democracy? What are, what are the threats 
so focusing on our work in the United States, but globally, but just let's focus on the US, what are the greatest threats to a strong American democracy today and into the future? And as we analyze that, we saw climate, of course, uh, as a threat because climate is the existential threat. Um, we saw uh, the issue of uh, growing um, uh, the, the violence and, and the kind of terrorism that we were seeing um, being a threat to a strong American democracy. Uh, we also identified inequality as a, a, a growing threat. And where we landed was um, as, as to what we have in our assets and capabilities, expertise, heritage, wisdom to work on of those three was really inequality, right? So we had to do some level of assessment of, yes, you know, as, as you know, in philanthropy, there are all kinds of problems, but that doesn't mean that you have the capacity to work on them. I mean, right? I mean, we're not, um, we're not a vaccine um, foundation. I mean, the Gates Foundation has far more capability, history, legacy, and expertise to deploy for vaccine, vaccines, right? We have a history, human rights, economic justice, racial justice, women's rights, various. And these are all areas where inequality manifests. And so we believe, and we, again, through good research, know that there is a correlation of growing inequality and growing hopelessness. And we believe that hope is the oxygen of democracy. And when hope leaves a society, I mean, a democratic society, that society will atrophy. And democratic institutions, norms, the public square for that democracy will atrophy and we will have a harder time doing the work of democracy building and stewarding because the thing we know about democracy is that we can never take it for granted and so our focus on the institutions who promote and protect democracy became the sort of number one strategy out of that diagnosis and determination that we would focus. So we decided to focus on inequality. And if we want to focus on inequality and democracy, the number one strategy was strengthening democratic institutions, because those institutions will need to protect our democracy. And so that may be media organizations, because we believe as we did with our, our, our work to help create the Corporation of, for Public Broadcasting and public media in general, NPR, and all of those early investments we made, that it was important to have an informed citizenry through fact and evidence-based journalism. So that has continued to be a strand of our work. It is important that we have institutions that protect and promote voting rights, for example, and it is why in 1965, the Ford Foundation was supporting the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to sue the states of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, because in 1965, those states continued to suppress the votes of African-American citizens of those states. We continue to support some 60 years later, organizations like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to ensure that all citizens have access to the right to vote. And that includes litigation against secretaries of states or litigation against whomever the entity may be that is seeking, it involves, it includes organizing and educating the public about the risks associated with a democracy when it suppresses the votes of particular citizens, classes of citizens, races of citizens, geographies of citizens. And so 
for us, everything comes back to democracy. Everything comes back to that issue. And again, as I said earlier, the focus on capitalism is important for us. Um, it's important because the, um, and, and I've had people say, what is the Ford Foundation worried about capitalism or, or, or criticizing capitalism as, as, a, as a, a critic said of me recently. And I was criticizing the kind of capitalism that, that nearest to my benefit, I, I'm, I'm a super one percenter. And um, the, the last few years for me personally, as a capitalist have been amazing more than this poor little kid from a shotgun house on a dirt road in East Texas. I mean, I, I, my grandfather who had a third grade education couldn't have imagined. I mean, but while I know that I am doing better and that people like me are doing better, I know that there are far too many Americans hurting and feeling left out and left behind and angry and disenchanted. And we know this from the data, right? So this isn't just a political, we know that. We know, for example, that some 45% of people under the age of 40 actually have a negative view of capitalism, right? So when I spoke at Davos, the, the last Davos meeting, I said, you know, we capitalists should be really worried about that. I mean, this isn't like some left-wing conspiracy. I mean, like young people, the way they have experienced capitalism is a very different way. If your introduction to capitalism is that your student loan, which you had to take out because your poor working class parents couldn't pay for your education. So you're $100,000 in debt and you find out that, you know, Wall Street has securitized your student loan with thousands of others. and they're being sold out into the market. And, and you're wondering why am I calling JP Morgan about what ought to be a public good, my ability to go to college. Um, and so it's that intersection of democracy and capitalism that I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in the challenge in a democracy that depends on evidence-based, fact-based, news and information when capitalism actually generates the opposite, right? We know that there is more money to be made in disinformation, that there is more profit for actually not telling the public the truth. And we know that from the research on social media that the way in which people engage in information is all about engagement and that you are more likely to be engaged in information that is actually not fact-based. That's, it's boring, it's boring. It's much more interesting to be engaged. And again, all that the social media companies care about quite candidly is engagement because engagement is monetizable. Yeah. And yeah. so what you're engaged on is really, generally speaking, not that it is being engaged. And so for me, I worry that, that our democracy depends on our ability to have good news and information and to be informed citizens. And yet our economic system has rendered that as It's not possible to make a lot of money, right? On that kind of journalism, which is why journalism and, and media remains very important to us. I'm sorry, Heather, I've gone on for far too long. No, that's really, that's really helpful. It sets the context. Once you decided on inequality, and I know this was in conversation with, with the board, how did you communicate that message internally to your team and cast the vision for your team members? Because it was a shift for many of them, I imagine. Absolutely. And how did you approach that? What was important to you in that conversation? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Heather. The, the, in, a, in a legacy organization, and you know, I have conversations with philanthropists, new philanthropists all the time about this very question. In a legacy foundation or any legacy organization, one of the real challenges 
is that over time, you become more focused on preservation than innovation. And you get over 80 years of history at the Ford Foundation, particular ways of doing things, uh, particular um, uh, fiefdoms and things that where people want to protect. Um, and, and, and you have to disrupt that. And so it was painful at times, Heather, to actually do the work once we agreed. And we also agreed that we were reorganizing and, and, and that required some people to leave the foundation. Um, we agreed that we had core um, deficiencies, right? And so for an organization like Ford, um, and the colleagues, for me to stand in front of them and say, we've been, uh, we've got a great history, but we have some deficiencies as we go into a future. And, and so just naming one of those, for example, was technology, that we had no one with any technology experience, capability, credentials, and that in order to do the work, we needed what we, what I call public interest technologists. And, and there was this immediate, you know, pushback, you know, oh my goodness, we're, we're now following the trends and we just, you've been hanging out with Silicon Valley billionaires too much, you know, this is, I mean, so there was a lot of just pushback in, a, in many areas like that. Um, and I think what it required was the board um, and I being in full alignment and acknowledging that there would be a period of dislocation, um, a period uh, where there were some unhappy people, where narratives about the Ford Foundation, the internal changes, particularly with those, um, you know, th there are, just as with, with government or with IBM or any, there are people with histories who, who view their, wor their, their work, even when they've left the organization, as protecting that history um, uh, and protecting um, the, well, they don't, I was gonna say the brand, but at Ford, you know, when you say words like that, people get very concerned because branding is a for-profit idea. And, but in fact, we do have to think about our brand and there are people who feel they need to protect the brand, the old brand. And, and so you're just, you have to push against that. But as long as the CEO and the board are in alignment, and I had lots of closed doors executive sessions with the trustees saying, okay, do you understand that when I close this program, this is what's going to happen. Do you understand former trustees are going to call and say you're letting him run him or, or whatever, right? Um, and that did happen. And it was very important for me to have that understanding with them at the beginning. So I wanted to uh, just I have two more questions for you before I open it up to the team. One is to just um, ask you a little bit about partnerships with other funders. And that can be we talk about that in philanthropy, it can be hard to do. So just a lesson learned for where you were able to work together with another funder or where it's challenging to work together with other funders to accomplish some of the important work in, in the world. It is absolutely more challenging to work together uh, with other funders than to do it alone. And, but what I said to the trustees during the interview process was, we are going to have to be a better collaborator and partner because in order to achieve our mission to move towards strengthening democracy, working on the, we're gonna need partners. The, the days of foundations believing themselves as loan actors um, in an ecosystem, um, that may still exist, but those foundations are kidding themselves. The problems that we are mission to solve are far too complicated for any one foundation. So we have as an MO to partner. I know it takes more time. I know the sort of brain damage of, I mean, believe me, I, I, you know, when we did the social bond last year and we issued the billion dollar bond and I was, I was explaining, you know, basically getting my board's approval. And, but I said, you know, <clears throat> I am talking to a number of other foundations legacy foundations to do the same thing. And one of them said, well, why are you, I mean, it's a billion dollars, it's Ford. I mean, just go out and do it, you know? And I actually said, it, actually, it will be more powerful 
um, if it is if it invo involves others. And even the the uh, my friend John Palfrey at MacArthur, I was talking to his board chair on like a Friday night. I was stalking this poor man. I felt, I mean, he, I'm sure it was just like, why is this man stalking me? But I was stalking him because I wanted MacArthur to be in. Um, it was really important to me to have other partners, and so to build that net of Ford, MacArthur, Kellogg. Mellon was working through Ford, through four board meetings, through four different board chairs, keeping it all, keeping us all on the Zoom screen when someone would say, but my lawyer said that if we do this, this, so I don't think we can do, you know, keeping them on the screen and get your lawyer on the screen too. So, I mean, and that kind of like constant um, is, is really tough. And, you know, we went through this with, with the Detroit bankruptcy, you know, when, when the, the, the bankruptcy judge asked me to chair the philanthropy. So we had 13 foundations around the table, everyone who funded in Detroit, and everyone was saying, we can't fund a bankruptcy. I mean, we, we, uh, our board won't, I mean, there was all these, you know, my view was, we have to get out of our way. We have to get out of our normative way of thinking about what a foundation can do. Um, and, and particularly in that case, I mean, it was, you know, the city, I mean, you know, and for us, I mean, obviously Detroit, it's the Ford Foundation. And even though we had this fraught history with the Fords and with Detroit, I was really trying to change that direction. But my point is just, you're absolutely right, Heather. It is like in a relationship, you know, I mean, it is like in a relationship. Um, I, I sadly lost my partner of 26 years. And I, I know, I remember there was a time when we were in marriage counseling and I was saying, and the therapist was saying something about, oh, um, would you rather be on your own trajectory in life and whatever, you know? And, and, and I was like, you know, some days it's just easier to just <laughs> not have to always think about what he wants to like get through this relation. I mean, like some days I just like to wake up and think about what I want, right? I mean, it's a relation, it's, it is, but at the end of the day, you know that the relationship will be better and that your life will be richer in spite of the fact that they may drive you crazy on certain days. Yeah. Your life will be richer with that other person. It's the same thing I find. It was a much richer experience. We could have done that social bond. There would have been Ford Foundation, Ford Foundation, you know, all the ego, all the logos, all the ego logo stuff would have been fulfilled. My comms people would much prefer, much prefer it be Ford Foundation only than me going out, you know? But at the end of the day, it was a richer story because it became a story about philanthropy, not about Ford. And for me, that's the impact we were trying to have through that initiative in part. Great, well, thank you for that. And of course, both of those stories are great examples of your leadership in trying to broker those partnerships. And for the JTF team, I'll try to find a great write-up on the partnership in Detroit because that's a phenomenal, remarkable story um, that I think is worth sharing. Let me um, invite the JTF team to begin putting some uh, questions in the chat before I bring forward any of your questions. One last question for you, Darren. It's been a challenging year for mm -hmm the world. When you think about your team there at the Ford Foundation, how do you try to encourage the individual team members, keep them focused, even as they work remotely? Of course, you're somewhat of a remote workforce uh, anyway, but what are you doing to encourage your team? What words of encouragement can you give to my team as we sure. close our conversation? Yeah, I mean, one thing is that I um, did from the very beginning and continue to do even this morning with our team in our office in Cairo is just first acknowledge that our colleagues are experiencing trauma. That whether you are um, sitting in a nice, comfortable apartment on the east side of Manhattan or you are in uh, Beijing or in uh, you know Cape Town, the last year has been traumatic. And we have to acknowledge that we are in a field where people need us now more than ever. And so when I think about my team in West Africa, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of uh, civil unrest because of the way policing in Lagos and, and Nigeria has been carried out in such an authoritarian, violent way, I know those are our grantees that, that, are, that are out there on the front lines and our program officers are engaging with them. They're traumatized. The grantees 
are traumatized? And how do we think about resilience? How do we think about having the capacity to sustain the blows that come with the daily experience of trauma? So I think about that a lot as, as leader of this organization and in the way in which I try to manage the team um, and keep people motivated, inspired, and understanding the urgency, but also understanding that we are human beings and that we too are experiencing um, really profound, profound emotional, psychological pain and anguish and grief over what is happening. Um, and, and that we have to approach our work with generosity and grace um, and love and that we have to talk about that as I do with them and, um, and know though that we're not every day, all of us going to be okay. And that it is actually okay to not be okay. And, and, to, and to make sure we don't stigmatize people because I am such a 365, 24 seven, urgent, get it done now that actually it's okay to not be okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, a question from one of uh, my colleagues, Samantha.